This is the Bigger Pockets Podcast, show 235. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online. What's going on, everybody? This is Josh Dorkin, host to the Bigger Pockets podcast, here with my co host, Mr. Brandon Turner. What's going on, man? You know what? There's a lot of things going on. Actually, there are. There, there's not really that, actually that, that much. That was like my seventh take. Yeah, that took seven tries for you to say, <laughs> This is the Bigger Pockets podcast. And then, What's going on? Over, I don't know. It's like you had never done this I just, before. That was I, I just I couldn't get the words out of my mouth. A little, yeah. little fumbleitis there. Host. Host. host, host, the hostess host. with, the, with the mostest. That would be you. I am the hostess with the mostest. I think so. I, I think so. I hey, means. man. So today, today's show, today in general is a big day. That's going to change. It's going to change the history of mankind forever. Wow. At least, whoa, at least whoa. <laughs> the lives. Slow, slow your roll, Elon <laughs> Musk. <laughs> it's going to change a lot of lives and here's why because today there are two excuses that every single newbie on the planet hey brandon yes says oh oh you want to finish i'm gonna finish this oh they use excuses what are those two excuses josh um i'm not handsome enough and i'm <laughs> that's not your good excuses. enough that's your excuses no most everyone says i can't find any deals i can't oh. and i don't have any money we all want to be real estate people yes yes, yes. i so, cannot find deals i, I don't know where to get money. How do I do this? What do I do? And we're not we're not mocking you guys. We get no, it. Like I get it. it's, it's tough. This is this is difficult. Well, guess what? It's actually not difficult if you know how to do it, yep. where to go, and what to do. And today's show is dedicated to that. Today's show, we're actually gonna go pretty broad. We we the typical bigger pocket show goes really, really deep. We dive in on topics and and we just keep digging and digging and digging. This show is more of a broad swath. Of a, a smorgasbord. A, and uh, g, there's a G at the end. Smorgasbord. Yeah, smorgasbord. No way. Is it really? Oh yeah, Google it. No, right I now. gotta check this out. I'm gonna. He's he's gonna look it up. While while he looks it up, I'm gonna keep talking. So today's show is really wide. It's really I don't broad. S M O R G I I can't spell it either, but Google should fix it for you. Um, and uh, we go really it, broad. Board B O R D is in dog. No way. Sm- no, you talk because I'm gonna look it up. I don't, I don't buy it. Wikipedia is a type of Scandinavian meal originally. No, originated there's in two Sweden. spellings. Don't even try it. Where? There's a G. Smorgasbord. I let me. I don't know if I believe this. This is Smorgasbord. No, there's a there's a regional field place called a regional f- food vendor place that I called Smorgasborg. Son of a gun. There's a D. I've been writing that word completely wrong for all these years. Well, however, no, well, it does say it's an alternative spelling uh, according to I think the they free might dictionary. Have changed it. Just like, you know, back in the day, you wouldn't know this because, you know, you're like six years old. But back in the day Seven. when we took typing classes, yeah. you actually would put two spaces after a period. And I then at that. some point in time, they said, no, you only do one space. Same thing. They probably changed it. Probably. We're going to assume like that just lot, so you're not wrong. A space, a lot. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going to fight this one. I'm going to fight this one. All right. Anyway. Well, great. It's, a, it's a smorgasbord. De. Smorgasbord. De good okay. <laughs> we dive in on finding and finding great deals. And, yep. the, and, and the beauty of that is not only do we talk about these topics, which you should – Definitely dive in and investigate, yep. um, and, and we'll talk about that a little more in today's quick tip. But today's book marks the launch. Today's podcast, book, today's show podcast, marks the launch of our newest book. It does titled "Finding and Funding Great Deals: yeah. The Hands-On Guide to Acquiring Real Estate in Any Market" by author Anson and Young. podcast guest Anson Young. And this, so, this book is fantastic. We're going to talk about it during this show, so we don't need to go into it now. But uh, basically, this book, Finding and Funding Great Deals, is all about that. How do you find properties? How do you fund them? And today, Anson goes through a ton of strategies for both these things. So make sure you listen to the show and then go pick it up. You can get it at biggerpockets.com forward slash great deals. 
Fourbiggerpockets.com slash store where you can find that in any of the other titles on Bigger Pockets. There With that, listen. So we got a great show. What is today's quick tip, which quick I tip. just alluded to? All right. Today's quick tip is very simple. So today on the show, we talk about a lot of strategies, but like Josh said, we don't dive, like we don't spend an hour on each one because we would be here for like 400 hours. And so uh, if there's a topic that we cover today, for example, you know, he covers HELOCs, right? You can go to biggerpockets.com, anywhere on the site, and there's a navigation bar, the whole you know blue bar that goes across the top of the screen. There's a little search thing in there. Just search for that term, and then you're going to find potentially hundreds, if not thousands of results from podcasts to uh, webinar replays to forum conversations to blog posts. Just be careful. Like when you, when you get your results page on the left side, take note of the left side. You can choose different search categories, meaning are you searching in the forums and the blog and the podcast, whatever. And uh, you can find pretty much any topic in the world, uh, all the information you'd ever want. And guess how much that costs, Josh? Related to real estate. Related to real estate. Guess how much that costs? Oh, man, that's $997, is $997 a day. No, it's totally free because totally Josh free. is a good guy and he likes to give away free stuff. Democratizing the Democratizing. real estate investing landscape. That is why we are here. That anyway, is. anyway, 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 great quick tip. Show 235 of the Bigger Pockets podcast. Let's get into this thing. As we mentioned before, today's show is about finding and funding great deals with host, with host, with guest. Guest. I'm so excited I can't get my words straight with guest <laughs> Anson Young. So let's bring him out. Anson, welcome to the show, man. It's good to have you here. Thanks for having me back, by yeah. the way. Yeah, you know, everyone said we shouldn't do it, but Josh was like, you know I, what? I'm going to do it. I'm going to get him on. Going against better judgment over there. No, definitively, definitively going against better judgment. Now, this is this is going to be a good show because there are two things that every single, I don't know, maybe not every single, but almost every newbie says right now that they're really struggling with. And not even newbies, right? Every investor is struggling with two things today, I feel like. How do, what, what, what are those two things, Brandon? Those two things are how to have hair as good as Josh Dorkin and how Ooh. to be as tall as Brandon Turner. Those are the two things everyone's talking about. No, it is how do I find great deals? How do I fund great yep. deals? And you know what? We're talking to the man who wrote the book. He wrote it. He, he wrote, wrote the, the book. book he wrote the book. Finding and Funding Great Deals by Anson Young. That's right. Dude. That's very true. <laughs> yes. Both of those things are covered in that book, believe it or not. No <laughs> way. I, no way. I know. It, Wait, yeah. does the body actually meet the title? That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It does. Wow. It's very good. That's amazing. Well, that's so, what we're going to talk so, about today. You can just, you know, yes. you can just listen to the next hour and then you'll have everything you need. But I would recommend buying Anson's book because I've read it. It's amazing. So I'm, let's do yeah, it. Yeah, I, I was just going to read the whole book right let's now. Let's do it. Let's do it. And oh, we don't even need to do an audible book. book. Uh, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> On that note, is it coming out with an audible book? Are we already doing audio? Oh, sweet. Yep. Yeah, I'm about this is how we roll. third of the way through that. Okay, so well, isn't that the most miserable experience recording an audiobook? Uh, uh, it's not like too it. bad so far. Oh, really? Oh, I hate it. I can't stand yeah. it. <laughs> Can we get into this? All right, people let's do this. Are waiting. Yes, They're yes. dying. All They're right, we're dying gonna... to find out what's going on. Yeah, so, uh, why don't we hear do who I you are first? Deals? Well, for, before we get that, let's hear who are you, Anson, in case you, we have, oh, yeah. people have no idea who you are. What do you, who That's are you? What do yeah, I, I've been before. on it once or twice. Um, again, against better judgment. Yeah. Uh, you, you, you guys never <laughs> need, need better judgment. I'm, yeah. I'm Anson Young. I work in Denver. Um, I am a real estate investor, fix and flipper, wholesaler, wholesaler, um, a licensed real estate agent. Um, I kind of do a little bit of, of everything in that spectrum. Um, I have aspirations towards uh, having hair as good as Josh, being as tall as Brandon, good being Keep being a it. landlord, maybe uh, maybe a mobile home park in in maybe. my future. Oh, and then uh, I'm rubbing off on you. I'm, I'm not yeah, you are. <laughs> Can't ignore those numbers. And then maybe development down the line, Ooh. which um, I find very appealing. So very cool. That's a little bit about me. So cool. so what what gives you the right to write a book on finding and funding great deals? Have you? Have you have done you that any? before? Have you? <laughs> have you? How how many deals have you done in your career thus far? I found and funded a, a good number of deals. Probably, um, I'm a little over a hundred wholesales, wow. and I'm about seventy five fix and flips in that in that range. That's and, awesome. uh Yeah, so found and and funded a, a handful for sure. Yeah, a handful. A few that's, handfuls. That's solid. That's, that's solid. a big yeah. hand. That's a big hand. You know, <laughs> that's like a Brandon Turner size hand. My hands are actually pretty small for as tall as I am. <laughs> You know what they say about you know what they say about you know what they say about guys with big hands? What do they say? Big gloves. So ah. uh, let's talk All about right. finding deals. We're gonna start there, then we'll go to funding deals later. So 
What, I'm gonna start this way. I'm brand new at real estate, I don't know what I'm doing. What are the common mistakes that I'm going to make when finding deals? What do most newbies do? What do they screw up on? What are those mistakes when finding deals? I think, I, well, there's a lot there because uh, I run into this on a daily basis, but I think for new investors, um, you know, they focus on, I think, the wrong things up front. So when you sit down with a new investor and they're like, like, oh, I, this is what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm going to create my LLC. I'm going to create yeah. my team. I'm going to have my, my lawyer and my accountant and my agent. And, you know, I'm going to line up all these people to be on my team. And then I'm going to go get business cards and I'm going to go get t-shirts made and wrap my car. And, 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 wow. and that's all well and good. That's all good stuff that you probably need in the future. What you should be focusing on today is actually going out and doing things that will find you deals. Like Say it in today, so Anson. Right? I know. <laughs> and so it seems backwards where people are putting, you know, putting all these things in front of, you know, they have they'll have a great logo and they'll have a great business card and they'll have a whole team of people, but there's nothing to back it up. They've never done a deal. They're not going and doing deal finding activities, whether it's driving for dollars or uh, mailing or networking or um you know, getting together with wholesalers, that, that kind of stuff. It's, uh, they seem to be focused on the, the stuff that you should worry about maybe six months to a year into it. Yeah. And, and, uh, and I see people get, get wrapped up in that whole thing and I go, well, how, you know, what are you doing to actually find deals? And they kind of have this blank stare of <laughs> like, Oh, well I have an LLC. Oh, well, that's great. Yep. I, buyer's I, list. I'm, I'm, I got a buyer's yeah, list. Yeah. I, I got yeah. a buyer's list. Right. Like, oh, okay, well, are yeah, you selling yeah. those buyers any deals? No. Okay. Yeah. What are yeah. we doing then? Yeah. Like, we're just playing business, you know, yep. we're not, we're not actually <laughs> yeah, investing. We're playing business. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> all right. So uh, th that's great. That makes a lot of sense. And we talk about that a lot. Like there's all these little things that like everybody gets caught up in like, Oh, I got to do this. And they're stressing out about it. Like at the end of the day, this business is about finding deals, having a strategy with which you're going to do something with those deals and then executing on that strategy, right? And that, yeah. And that's a great point. I'd say that the second thing that they do wrong is they don't laser focus into something that, uh, you know, focus on one thing and run after it a thousand percent. You know, they yeah. might be scrambled with like, oh, there's a lease options and there's this and there's sub two and I could do direct mail or I can go knock on doors. Focus on something. And yeah. then go run after it, like laser focus. If, if if I had laser focus at the beginning, my first two years could have catapulted me, you know, and I could be 10 times further than I am today. But I kind of had 10 different strategies and trying to work them all that, you know, having that laser focus, I think is huge. Yeah, okay. Absolutely. So, so, so step one is, you know, obviously you have to figure out what you're kind of looking for, right? You have to set right. criteria, say, Hey, I'm looking for single family houses between 100 and 300,000 in the X, Y, and Z kind of area or city or whatever it is. And I want something that, you know, requires kind of light cleanup or something that requires, you know, extensive cleanup, wh whatever it is, that's your criteria, right? You set that. Now, right. what do you do? Now you got to go and find that. Right. You wrote a whole book on this topic, Anson. <laughs> wrote a whole book on this topic. So that's right. What is what is somebody need to do to to find those deals? So let's just read through the book, chapter one. No. Um. <laughs> so I th I think I think that analysis piece is huge. Uh, knowing exactly where you're going to be, and I think that that's that should be step one. It's kind of analyzing your target market. Where do you want to be for what you want to do? Let's say. Brandon is brand new and he's tall and good looking and he wants to go That's right. uh, wholesale deals. And so what, what you know, kind of what's step one, like where is he going to, to, to do this in Denver where, and so analyzing that market, finding out where the highest concentration of cash sales are um, going and networking with investors to find out what they're buying and where. So if you talk to 10 investors and you say, um, tell me about your last couple deals. And they'll say, "Oh, I buy three bedroom, two bathroom, uh, you know, in X, you know, in this neighborhood for you know one hundred fifty thousand dollars." And you go, "Okay, there's a data point." And so, the more people you talk to, the more cash sales you can get your hands on to analyze where are investors buying, what are they buying them for, and then kind of reverse engineer that whole process to say, "Well, Brandon, uh, Brandon can then take all that information and say, okay." It seems like these two zip codes are where a ton of investors are working, and he can, re you know, he can then go start doing what it takes to try to find deals in that area. So if he has a budget for direct mail, he can go direct mail. If he has 
no budget and he wants to uh, go ahead and uh, knock on doors or he wants to you know do something low budget like bandit sign or something like that he can he can go that route but finding where to do do that first activity is huge otherwise you're just as scattered as if you're doing 10 different uh, methods you need like one or two zip codes to kind of like hone in on and, and the right ones and the right method so kind of I'm, I'm gonna ch- go ahead Oh, sorry. I, I was just going to ask a question because I think a lot of newer investors probably have this question. Anson, you just said, you know, look and find the area that that um, other investors are working. Isn't that a bad idea? Isn't that like, you know, going where the crowd is? Um, shouldn't you be looking where other people are not looking? Or is that actually the wrong strategy because people are looking there because the opportunities are better there? What What's your take on that? Well, let's say you had, um, let's say you do an, an analysis of uh, 10 different zip codes and you say, you know, the number one has 50 sales. Let's say like two of them have 50 sales of investor cash sales in the last three months. And then the other seven have like five investor cash sales. It makes more sense to start in those first two where there's higher concentrations of where people want to buy. It's kind of like, you know, you, you know what the demand is. Now you got to go offer the supply. So when you go in and you and you see, okay, these guys are buying here for a reason. They must be great rentals. It must be great for fix and flips. Um, there's ways to analyze for both of those things. It makes way more sense to kind of go and offer that supply where the demand is. Then, tr- yes, you can make money in those other zip codes, but it's going to be harder to find investors because it's not it's not an investor heavy area. Now okay. that could be like. That those could be good fix and flip zip codes or something, um, maybe higher end or whatever the, the the reason is for it not having as much cash sales. But if you're just starting out, you kind of want to go and look where everybody's buying and why they're buying. And then if you can offer the supply, you're in a good position yeah. as a wholesaler at least. I like so that. how how does somebody determine whether there's lots of cash sales happening in an area? How do I figure that out? So um, the the two ways that I like, um, one is to network with agents. Um, it literally should take an agent about three minutes to to get you a report of the last you know six months of activity for cash sales off of their MLS system if you're not licensed. And then another way is through a company like ListSource where all that data ends up anyways, and you can purchase a list that says, here's all the cash sales in this, you know, the Denver metro area, and then you can kind of filter it through from there. But having that data is, is usually step one. Um, another way, it's a little bit slower, but networking with other agents, to, or not other agents, other investors, to know where people are buying, and you can kind of create data points from there. So if a bunch of people are buying in one or two zip codes that you talk to, then you have a good idea of where there's a lot of activity. That makes sense. Thank you. I like that. Any, anytime. All right, sure. so uh, great, so we're gonna look great for chatting the, with you. Yeah. <laughs> can I can I talk to? Is that is that is that cool? Yeah, All right. d- dive on in there, buddy. <laughs> All right, good. So I want to talk about this. You mentioned going where there is a lot of competition in a way, right? I mean, it's almost counterintuitive. You're saying go where a lot of other investors are buying, but if I do that, now it's a lot harder because I've got tons of competition. So how do I overcome that? How do I stand out uh, to the to the sellers or to whoever I'm trying to get the deal from? How do I stand out and get those deals? And that's that's the million dollar question right there is is how do you cut through you know your competition to so be buy my course for nine ninety seven and I'll tell you the secret yes. yeah okay Brandon <laughs> I will where do I send that um that and that's a great question you are going where there is a little bit more competition but if if nobody's buying in those other seven zip codes there's no point in you looking in there because you're not going to find an end buyer at least it's going to be a lot harder to um so I think um. When it comes to standing out, there's there's a lot of schools of thought there. Um, if you're doing something like direct mail, I try to stand out with my pieces. They're not going to look anything like my competition's pieces. If I'm doing you know cold calling, um, not a lot of people are doing cold calling, so that alone stands out. You know door knocking, not a lot of people are door knocking, so that alone stands out. And you know being a a, a professional um, also stands out in you know the the kind of wholesaling. Uh, beginning real estate investor world, you know, being a being a professional, doing what you say you're going to do stands out, or just calling people back stands out because you would you might be surprised, but 
people actually don't call people back and they don't treat people professionally. And so when they encounter an investor who has stepped that level up, you automatically stand out. So kind of a combination of all those things of doing what your competition isn't doing to stand out. And then if you are kind of playing with them in a like a direct mail kind of game, make sure that you're standing out. So you're not just sending them the same old tired yellow letter or the same old postcard that they get. You know, they have stacks of those. What don't they have? Send them something that'll stand out. Yeah. And like and that. then when you do, you know, I, I think that point of professionalism is huge. And and I think it's something that's sorely lacking in our uh, in our space, unfortunately, by by a lot of folks. So if you if you can elevate and do that, that that's great. So, you know, you get somebody on the phone. You know, we're we're talking about finding these deals, you know, and we're gonna dive in a little bit on 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 some of the things that you mentioned. But like, all right, I get somebody, I door knock, somebody's there. I send a piece of mail, there's somebody who answers it. Like somebody responds to you. Oh my God, freak <laughs> out, right? Like, what now? What do you what do you say? How does how does somebody deal with somebody saying, Oh, I want to talk to you? Okay. Right. And what do you do? And that's funny because I think that there's been somebody on your show who said like they got that first call and they're so nervous they kind of threw, threw the their phone. phone across <laughs> the room. I think that and was I Danny. Think Danny that Johnson story. said that. Was it? Yeah, yeah. Danny yeah I think it was Danny. And you know, and that comes with experience, obviously, uh, being comfortable with picking it up and knowing what to say. But um, I think when you're just starting out, it, it would help to uh, start off with a blueprint or a script that you could kind of walk through with the seller, so that you're not just you know, fishing for information. You're not just trying to pull it off the top of your head. You have something in front of you that says, okay, you know, tell me what year the property was built. And you kind of go through the process of finding out the information from the seller that you need in order to analyze the deal and, um, and, and do it in a professional manner. So I th- not like script like a robot, but definitely something that you can follow that keeps you on track so that you can say, oh, let me tell you about our process. And 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 here it is, Mr. Seller. And then, you know, I, mind if I ask you some questions about the property so I know more about it and um, and kind of go through an entire script where it keeps you on track. So then it, it kind of takes out that should take out that nervous part where you don't know what to say, you don't know where to go next, you don't know what to say next. All of a sudden, now you have something to follow. So you know what I'm, uh, I'm Anson. <laughs> I am calling about yes. your <laughs> property at right. three four three Johnson Street. Thank you. I yes. would like to purchase your property, please. Well, tell so, it to me now. I, I think a lot of people look at scripts that way. Like, oh, I don't want to do a script because it's just it's going to sound informal. But it, to yep. me, a script is not about reading the script. It's like a checklist. You guys read the Checklist Manifesto? You guys read that book? Yep. Yeah. So the whole book. Okay. The whole book's about like fantastic how, book. Yeah, fantastic about how much checklists have made like this huge impact on a number of industries. Like being a pilot, like they have a ton of checklists. Being a doctor, hospitals. They have checklists, hospitals. Yep. It saves lives like crazy because even though we know things we don't often do them in the heat of the moment right so like when i go off my script like i always inevitably forget to ask certain questions like you know i don't know what are the taxes or or you know anything i there's a million questions i want to know the answer to i forget but when i have a script i'm basically just going through and using it like a checklist to make sure i get every point otherwise i gotta call them back again or i gotta guess on something and then the deals I don't know what I'm going to get. So, yeah, I, I think that's really valuable. So do you, uh, in the book, do you talk about scripts? I mean, do you have some kind of like, at least like uh, ideas on what people can do? Yeah, I do talk about scripts and, and having one. Um, I can't remember if there's a sample in there or if there's a sample in the bonuses of uh, of a, you know, a script that I use. But either way, and, they, get, they get one. Either way. Yeah, either okay. yeah, either way they e- okay. either way there's an example in there to that you know you can use it or you can use it as a launching point for your own script. Um, for me, I have that that exact script in Podio, and so as I'm going through it, I'm entering in their information. I I don't have ten thousand post-it notes everywhere. I have it in like a central CRM, so that then um, I I've done the script and then I have the information and it's all there and uh, and it's good to go. So Podio, I know um, you, we, had, we interviewed a few weeks ago, Nathan Brooks here on the show, and I know you and I are both good friends with Nathan, and uh, he talked yeah. about using Podio as well. So both of you guys convinced me that I need to use it. So I've been using it now with this mobile home park search thing. Uh, what I found is that with Podio, which is a CRM, you can make a, what they call a form. And so it's almost like a, a questionnaire. It looks like a front end of a website. And I just go through now and it asks yeah. every question I need to do. So I just go to my form and when I get a call on, on a deal, I just enter in all the information on the form. It makes it, and then it yep. goes right into my CRM. It's, it's really, really, really spiffy. Is that a word? Spiffy. Yeah. 
that is a word i think yeah but it's but it's good like like you said to have that checklist of the the calls i take in my car are way different than the ones i take in my (laughs) office because you know one i have a checklist and i have a, a a uh an actual script in front of me the other one i'm trying to make sure i you know, trying to think back to that script as I'm talking to him, you know, be like, oh, so when was that built? And then I, you know, I, it's probably nowhere near as good as when I'm in front of my computer at my office. So I have a suggestion. Yes, sir. Josh. How about you guys print out your checklist and leave a copy in your glove box Ooh. so that when somebody calls, you can talk on the phone and just look at the bu- checklist. You always print out 10 copies and keep 10 copies you know, in, Anson, your, in your glove box. He's Seems not, like a logical idea. He's not just a pretty face. Yeah. I that, also have that, a brain cell or two. That's a great idea. Yeah, I really do, do like that. I'm going to actually put my cool. script in my car as soon as we're done recording this. because that's a Look really at that! Change in the world. Instant action. Instant action. Instant action. That, I love it. That's what I like. Then I'd have to pull over, Josh, or I'd have. To, yeah. Ah. yeah. Well, you could just tape it to your yeah. windshield. Well, all over your windshield. Hopefully, while you're <laughs> taking phone calls with a seller while you're driving, you're not writing it down with your pen while you're driving, because obviously you want to write down that information. So of course not. Yeah, you yes. should pull over, Anson. Of course yes. not. So, so instead of my yellow notebook pad, I should have scripts in my car. Is what you're saying? Mm, okay. like can it. we all right that's, so moving on to the show here <laughs> the, no this is this is great stuff really really good um all right so we're working on we're talking about crms we're talking about all, all this stuff I, um, I have a question if i could jump in before we move oh on. yeah i want you to do that sure because we're talking about it. we talked about direct mail marketing uh, i'm curious about like who are you sending to what's working well for you right now in, in your direct mail so my like obviously you're not just going to send out to everybody in the neighborhood yep. i mean you could but um, you really want to target people who are most likely to sell in the near future, have some sort of reason to sell. And so, uh, one, my, my number one that I'd really like is, um, is old school driving for dollars lists. And, um, really? and that does take a lot more work than sitting down and just buying a list and then blasting out mail. Um, this involves obviously driving an entire neighborhood, um, writing down addresses and, uh, and I, and I think that, actual deferred maintenance, um, you know, the more beat up a house is, that is a great uh, distress point for a person to want to sell. They know that they may not be able to get, you know, full price on the market. Um, They don't want to deal with inspections and agents and appraisers and stuff that, you know, they know that their house is a bit beat up. Uh, Somebody like me can come in and buy it as is. And that would be a good reason for them to call somebody like me. So that is my favorite list is, uh, I guess a bit more more old school and archaic. It takes time and energy and effort to go get those names on a list, and I think that that that's worth it alone. All right, I like it. I like it a lot because again, it's it's doing things that not everyone else wants to do. I mean, there's there's easy ways to do things, and that's what everyone oh, yeah. does. And everyone coming out of the the guru boot camps or whatever want to do that. And then there's ways that use this little thing called work. And yeah, and, yeah, people don't yeah. like doing that, right? Yeah, the uh, more work it takes, I find the less competition I have. Yeah. So, I mean, for example, there's a there's a um, there's a county here in Colorado where the only way to get probate cases is to go down in person. You can pull twenty a day for a dollar a piece, and it, you don't know if it has real estate in it or not. But that's the most most direct way to get the data, versus another county where you can just email the administrator by, you know, buy them and they'll send you an, an Excel spreadsheet, you know, uh, a, a day later. So which one do you think is going to have more competition? It's going to be the one that's way easier to get. Nobody's yeah. going to want to go down, pull 20 records a day, but yeah. you have way less competition, the harder it is to get. So really quickly explain a probate in 30 seconds or less and why it matters. So probate is when uh, somebody dies they owned real estate and now their heirs or sometimes the state, whoever takes it over, then wants to sell it. So whether they had a will or not, there's different ways that it could go. Um, but you that that's pretty much the, the the gist of it. Somebody died and there's a house involved. Where does it go? Yeah, perfect. All right. Cool. So we've got yeah, we're 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 not going to give you the entire book. Obviously, <laughs> we want you guys to check out the book, but uh, we, we're trying to share some knowledge here, as we do on every episode of the Bigger Pockets podcast. And by the way, all the stuff that Anson puts in the book, all the stuff that frankly is in any of our books, you can find all this stuff. There there are no secrets here. Bigger Pockets, all this stuff is somewhere in and around Bigger Pockets and the community. 
Um, but Anson does a great job of structure, organizing, and putting this all together. Uh, the the book does a really good job of of kind of walking people through again finding and funding. So on finding, what other ways? I I know there's you talked about door knocking. You mentioned direct mail. There's MLS networking. What, what, what how else do you do this? So yeah, you you hit on another favorite of mine, which is networking and referrals. Um, I kind of lump those two together, but. Um, networking with agents, networking with other investors, um, networking with people who do estate sales, you know, networking with people who I call the gatekeepers who are in kind of the front line. It might be a probate attorney. Instead of going after probates, you might go after the probate attorney. And um, it might go after, I mean, in a nice way, not like put a hit out on them like, uh, you know, a mobster movie. But, you know, you want to go after them. You want to create relationships. You want to provide value and network with these people and let them know what you do and how it can benefit them and their clients. So it could be, you know, it could be your CPA. It could be, um, it could be almost anybody. But if you target, you know, agents obviously have pocket listings. They have, you know, they come across short sales. They come across, you know, uh, estate properties, probate properties, and, you know, they know that this thing is too beat up to put on MLS. Um, you know, they'll, they'll get a bunch of hassle. Maybe they have somebody like you who could buy it and take it off their hands. They're the hero to their client and everybody wins. So networking and referral, I think, is a big uh, thing that's overlooked. Everybody obviously talks about um, direct mail, bandit signs, kind of that kind of marketing. I think um, it's very underrated to go after these gatekeepers and uh, form a beneficial networking relationship with them. Okay. So I, I, a, cu- a couple of quick things. Um, we just had a great show. Uh, we recorded it today, in fact, as well. to say, <laughs> but, but it was show 232 uh, with Nathan Brooks. And we dove really, really deep on um, uh, using networking as a means to find deals. Uh, definitely check out that show if you have not already. Um, so, Okay, with with networking, you're talking about you know dealing with some of these professionals and other things. Like, what do I say, what do I say to them, and and how do I ultimately win trust um, from these people? So let's just take um, maybe real estate agents for an example. Um, obviously, a networking relationship should be beneficial to both parties. So you're not just taking, taking, taking. Um, if there's a way that you can provide value to you know, a real estate agent so that they can reciprocate. Um, I think that that's kind of the best way to get through to professionals is to, you know, as a marketer, I might get leads that I can't use. You know, somebody wants too much money or their payoff is too much. It might work out way better as a listing for an agent. So I'm sure that if I hand an agent listings um, or potential clients that they will keep me in mind when they come across you know, those, uh, an estate property or a probate property or hoarder property or something that they is outside their box. I'm handing them stuff outside my box. They're handing me stuff outside their box. It's mutually beneficial. That's great. That's great. And then you, you, um, you mentioned bandit signs and, you know, anyone who has been listening to the show for four years or, you know, you know, at all, or has been a part of bigger (laughs) pockets knows that, um, I have some real issues with bandit signs and, and, and so, you know, I'll just say my issues with bandit signs are, you know, a, a lot of people use them illegally. So they're putting up, putting up these signs in neighborhoods and slapping them up on, on telephone poles and stuff like that. When it, you're not allowed to do that. Um, it, it kind of, you know, it dirties up neighborhoods, it violates the law. So when is it okay to use a bandit signs is is it okay to use bandit signs and how do you do it in a way that's kind of you know ethical uh that doesn't make you look bad and um you know doesn't kind of continue to damage the industry as i think these do because anytime i talk to investors or non-investors are like oh yeah you you guys are the scumbags that put signs up all over the telephone poles and all over our lawns (laughs) now that's a great question um i am kind of in the same camp as you um i really dislike them as a method for what I do. Um, And that, that stems from being in a kind of a a higher priced hot market. Um, We have, you know, we have educated sellers. They know their house is worth money. You know, I was out in um, San Jose uh, talking to Aria a couple of weeks ago and I showed them, 
you know, in my presentation was like some bandit signs that were funny, like uh, Big Papa buys houses. And I'm like, <laughs> if you plant this in Silicon Valley, you you, you think you're going to get some calls? I mean, you you think you're going to get just people lined up to sell you their house? Or And, and I think that there's just different ways that, th- that things work in different markets. So I think bandit signs here in Denver, um, I don't see very many, honestly. Uh, a handful. A yeah. And I was just out in Ohio and I see, I know I saw a bunch, you know, like everywhere, every corner has, you know, three or four or five signs here. Not so much because I don't think that they're actually effective here. I think in like a lower end rental type market, let's just say uh, Memphis or somewhere where there's a lot of rental inventory you can buy under a hundred thousand. I think it's more effective, but yeah, it comes down to, is it legal to do there? Are you going to get fined? You know, a lot of people say, oh, if I just hide behind my Google voice number and don't yeah. return the phone calls, I mean, it comes back and gets you. You know, they have ways to find out who you are. And do yeah. you want to get hit by a huge fine and and take the hit to your reputation? Or, you know, me, I just, I don't like them. I do talk about them in the book for the sake of, yes, they do work in other markets. And, you know, make sure you check your local laws. But, um, you know, I, I don't think in a higher end market, they're nearly as effective. Fair yeah. enough. I also like, so I mean, like you could put it in like a, you know, a yard sign in someone's yard. I mean, like Brandon buys houses or, or whatever. If you want to put that in a yard you own, I mean, that's a good way to do it as well or stick it on the side of your car or whatever. You know, I find there are ways to use it that are not going to be trying to skirt the law. Yeah, I know. I was irritated when I see like Facebook conversations about like, how are you going to skirt the law and just put up, you know, put up higher or take them down on Sunday nights. I'm like, why are we as an industry trying to figure out how to break the law in order to make some money? Like we're not. Yeah, we're not. We're not. And I don't think we should be. And so like, yeah, I, yeah, be good. Yeah, I totally agree. There's, there's, there's definitely better ways to use them. I do like, um, how you said to put them like in the, in the yard of your project. If you're flipping a house, it could be a good brand recognition for your, for your brand. Um, and I do have one that's, it's corrugated and it sits in my own yard. Yeah. (laughs) So it's not breaking any laws. Yep. Uh, so it sits, you know, it sits in the yard of the house that I'm working on, just just letting know people know that hey, this this is coming soon, and uh, you know, we we would love to buy your house too if you want to sell it, kind of thing. Yeah. So awesome, there you go. There awesome. You go. Well, cool. So, oh, Brandon, go ahead. I was gonna say let's let's talk about the book real quick before we get too deep into this. I know we're gonna talk about funding deals, which I know people are really interested in, yeah, but yeah. Uh, I want to know a little bit more about the book. First of all, Anson, what's it called? <laughs> Finding and funding great deals. Finding and funding great deals. All right, that's sort of like a subtitle. Yeah, uh, it's the hands-on guide to acquiring real estate in any market, any All market right. guide. Mm, fancy. That's great. All that's right, great. And they can get it by going to biggerpockets.com/slash great deals and. Uh, You've got some bonuses that we're giving well, out. First with of all, the book, the book right? is launching July July thirteenth, oh, which it should be today. This podcast comes out today. If you're listening yeah. to this in the future, yeah, yeah. it's already launched. And uh, let me let me tell you guys real quick about the packages because there's two different types of packages you can buy if you want this book. Listen closely. So first of all, during the launch, we're having a special on both. So make sure you guys buy this during the launch. The first, I believe, it's ten days. Uh, you can buy the digital copy or you can get the ultimate package. I highly recommend the ultimate package because you get the print book, you get the ebook, and you get all the bonuses. So I definitely recommend that. And uh, you get a bunch of bonuses. So let's run through the bonuses. I'm going to actually ask Bonus. you about each one real quick, Anson. Is that cool? Okay. And you tell me in, cool. in one sentence what it's about. Number okay. one, seven deadly direct mail mistakes. What is that? This is standing out in your market and basically how not to do direct mail. All right. Okay. Like Property yeah. walkthrough inspection form. So just like you should have a script for your phone calls, you should have a script when you walk through a house, um, not a verbal script, but what you're looking for in the house, the windows, the furnace, what's the age of this, that, and the other thing, so that you don't have to go back out to the house later and you, you get it all in the first shot. Love it. Love it. All right. Number three, a call-in info sheet. So just like we were talking about, that's your script, that your, your, your blueprint, your checklist. Love it. The the ultimate door knocking guide. That's right. This is like a short ebook on, you know, everything from what to wear to what time of day to what to say. That rhymed way too much, but uh, <laughs> but uh, all of those things on on door knocking, which is a kind of a lost art. So it Very is. Cool. It is. Very cool. All right. Vi- all right. A, a video finding the deal, finding the ARV. So this is, um, I think it's part of all the, all the different videos linked together. Okay. Um, and this is, uh, taking that, that example deal. It's a real deal. And, uh, and 
drilling down into the comps and why I'm choosing the comps and what I think the ARV is based on those comps and why. That's so Sweet. important because every deal begins with understanding the AR- ARV, whether you're doing flipping or wholesaling, it begins with that number. And if you get that number, everything else becomes a lot easier. Exactly. So, very cool. I love that. All right. Video analyzing the deal, putting it all together using the BP calculators. That's right. So we, uh, so we find the target market, we find the ARV, and then we plug it all into the actual calculator and see if it is actually a deal or not. Very cool. All right, and the last thing here is only available during the launch, during the first week or so. It might be 10 days, I can't remember, but I think, I think it's a week. Uh, and that is the video of a property walkthrough. What is that? Oh, so uh, Zach and I went through a property and we went through basically all the things that, it was a real property, all the things that I look for, all the things that we were doing to it, and then, you know, basically an entire video walkthrough of this whole process. So it was... Uh, Kind of, uh, kind of estimating repairs as we're going through um, room by room of this property. That's awesome. 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 I love it. All right, guys. So uh, really quick to recap, this is Finding and Funding Great Deals. Uh, it's a fantastic book on both finding and funding the deal. Um, you can find it at biggerpockets.com slash great deals, or it'll be available uh, when it comes up at biggerpockets.com slash store, our Bigger Pockets bookstore. And uh, those bonuses are available through July 27th. Oh, uh, okay. Yes, 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 yes. So, Anson, awesome. This is great. Let's let's get back to this and let's talk about funding. Let's uh, and and guys, again, as a heads up, like obviously this is a podcast. We don't have time to dive in on every little thing as detailed as we are going to do it in the book. Um, that's why you should get the book. You should. But. Um, Anson funding deals. Yes. What do I need to know? You know, what's, what's important here? There's a, I mean, there's a lot, uh, there's a lot of what, how how do I do it? How do you fund a book? How do you fund a book? How do you fund a book? How do you fund, how how do you fund a deal? How do you fund a real estate deal? So it really depends on a lot of things. Like, uh, do you have any credit? Do you have a W2 job or not? Do you have a track record of, of deals that you've already done? Uh, what kind of deals are you trying to do? So if it's a fix and flip, obviously much different than if you were trying to fund a mobile home park or a you know hundred unit apartment complex. So it really depends on who you are, what kind of uh, d- what kind of deal you have, and then kind of going from there. So if if you have a W two job and you you're investing on the side, it might make sense to go get a bank loan if you're bankable. Um, a lot of people. What does that I'm, mean, by the way? Bankable. Yeah. Um, it definitely it means that is a bank going to look at you uh, and and see that you're you're easy to lend to. Somebody like me, where I have uh, you know multiple LLCs and uh, I don't have a W two job. I have a you know basically a uh, contractor type job at the end of the day and variable income and all that stuff. They look at somebody with a W two uh, a lot uh, a lot easier than somebody like me. So. Um, so, you know, those, those type of investors are great because they can go get bank loan after bank loan and until, you know, until they're full up, they have 10 properties or so, and then they have to maybe start looking outside the box then. But, uh, somebody like me, I might look for a fix and flip. I might look outside the box to more private money, hard money. Um, those, those type of deals. I love it. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So, uh, why don't we do, I thought this would be fun. I have a list here of things that you talk about throughout the book and, uh, different ways to fund deals. I thought maybe we just run through each one, just like we did a little bit ago with the book bonuses. Let's just talk about each one. Just give us a, a, a you know, a couple seconds on each one. Kind of who would want to use it? Why would you want to use that? What are the pros and cons? You know, whatever you can kind of sure. think of. Does that sound good? Yeah, Have absolutely. A, a quick little fiery round here. Number one, Fire. uh, you already mentioned this, but I'll, I'll do it again. Bank financing. When is that good to use? And when does that just does not work? So it's great, again, if you're bankable, it's great if you have uh, maybe a more long-term project like a rental, a development deal. Uh, bank loans have lower interest rates in, on average. And so if it's a longer-term project that you're going to be in for at least a year or two, uh, you know, up to 30 years on a, on a more of a rental, it's a great, uh, great way to go. All right. Awesome. All right. Next one. By the way, I, I just want to clarify the stuff we talk about here and the stuff that we're talking about that you talk about in the book, um, this is not just for flippers and not just for wholesalers, right? These techniques can be used by anybody looking for deals. I just want to make sure that we're, we're clear on this. No, you're right. It's, uh, it's definitely 
<laughs> it goes from zero to to all the way to closing the deal, and it does have analysis in there. But you know, at the end of the day, I don't care what you do with the deal after the book. You could you could rent it, you could flip it, you could you know burn it down for fun. I don't care what you do with it. <laughs> I just get you to the but point to the that. closing table. I love it. <laughs> don't burn it down, people. All right, next <laughs> for fun. Next way. Next way. Pri- private money. So private money is great for somebody who's maybe not as bankable um, and has more of a relationship lending uh, piece there. So uh, so relationship lending is more of uh, they're not going to check your credit. They, they care more about the deal. They care more about you as a person and your track record than anything else. And so this is a great way to you know have somebody – who you've worked with before fund a deal in the matter of hours instead of jumping through a thousand hoops at the bank or uh, going through a, a hard money loan. This is kind of that middle piece. The the interest rates a bit is definitely better than a hard money loan. The points are better, uh, but you're not going to get that low low interest rate with like you would with a bank loan. But the the positive side is that you can get deals funded quickly, and they care way more about the numbers and you as your track record than anything else. I assume friends and family would would fall under kind of private, right? Yeah, friends and family for sure. Um, and there's probably more private money out there than you think, um, funding deals every single day. And so going out and finding who these guys are, uh, guys and gals are, um, and then getting in front of them and saying, hey, you know, hey, I, I do these deals too. Are you looking to put more money at play? Here's my track record. So there is a track record piece there that you should have, um, unless it's friends or family and they, they like you for you and how tall you are and, yep. uh, and, <laughs> and go from there. So I like it. I like awesome. it. Right, what about awesome. hard, hard money and how is that different from private money? So hard money is, um, it, it's way less relation relational. There's, you know, three, four five big hard money lenders here in town. Um, you can fill out their loan application if they like the deal and you are somewhat bankable, um, cause they do look at your credit. They want to make sure you have some money in the bank, um, that you can actually, you know, float the payments and everything like that. Uh, the interest rate is, is pretty high, you know, somewhere up in the 14, 15% and they might have, you know, two to four points, which, uh, which really hurt in the long run, but you hey, know, so if what's, you need what's a point. So a point is, uh, is one percentage of the loan. Okay. So if you take out a hundred thousand dollar loan and there's four points, you would owe them four thousand dollars plus the interest rate, okay. so it it gets pretty painful pretty quick. But yeah. if you need to fund a deal relatively quickly and you're not as bankable, um, it could be a good way to go. And here's the beautiful thing about hard money. I remember when I first heard about it, I was like, "Who would ever pay that much money what for a terrible? That's people. terrible, right? Yeah, it's <laughs> horrible." But then I, I realized, like, all you have to do. I read this in a book. I don't remember which one, but it just said. This one I was just getting started. It said, it's okay. Yes, it's expensive. Just factor it into your numbers. Make your offer based on the hard money. And then it's not a big deal. Like it just it's part of the cost of doing business. And I thought, oh well, okay. So I just analyzed deals with that high interest and high fees. And then I did deals. So Yeah, and if a deal's a deal and the numbers work, the numbers work even yep. with that painful. Yeah, but as soon uh, as you can get away from hard, hard money, get some cheaper, cheaper yeah, money. Yeah, that's no, good. that's that's goal number one. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. All right, All right cool. cool. So next Cash. cash. Why, what, why, when, how to use cash. So cash is just like it sounds. You just bring a briefcase full of money to hey, title <laughs> and make it rain and then, uh, <laughs> and, you, and you get a property. And so, no, uh, I think it's, I think it's good for if you want to put your own money to work, if you don't want to, um, you know, you, you don't want to get financing for something. Uh, it, it's, it's usually the quickest and easiest way to do a deal. You have you know less title fees. You don't have any lending fees. Um, you could walk in and pay cash for a deal that somebody who's financed might not. They might look it over. If somebody's analyzing a deal with hard money, um, they factor in all those percentage points and the uh, APR, and they say, "Oh man, this isn't a deal." Someone with cash might walk in, and they don't have all those fees and all those uh, all those points and everything. So the deal looks much different when you have cash because you don't have as much uh, expenses. There's been a number of times also where I've purchased a property. In fact, I just did it a few months ago uh, where I purchased a property with cash and then immediately went and talked to a private money lender and and they just basically refinanced me. Uh, And I did that because I needed to move really fast, like faster than the private money lender would have done it. And so I just 
paid cash a month or two later, got financing, and then I had the cash freed up again. Oh, look at me. Big cash <laughs> spender. Wow. I just showed up with the- Make it rain. Come on. He did. Wow. He did. I got to put, put all that BP money to work. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So all we right. got- uh, Cash, which is always fun. And then we got, uh, oh, one more note on cash. A lot of times when you buy, and correct me if I'm wrong, when you buy from county like auctions and things like, uh, you know, government auctions, they require cash. You, can't, you like sometimes can't even get it out of their sources at all, right? Right. Yeah. Like here, you need to put down a deposit at the beginning of the auction. And if you win the foreclosure auction, you have to come back like at two o'clock the same day with the yep. balance. And yep. so not a lot of lenders can move that fast. And you need yep. a, a big fat cashier's check to do that. So. Cool. But by the way, re- really quickly, you know, what what a lot of new investors will do is um, they'll use cash as an excuse for buying a bad deal. So, yeah, yeah. well, since I'm not using leverage, you know, and I'm putting all this money down, you know, the deal looks like a great deal. But if you evaluate it from a leverage standpoint, the deal's not a great deal. And um, so, so when evaluating deals, definitely do it from a leveraged perspective, uh, because odds are you're not you're probably going to want to put your money to work in some other way than just sitting it in a property. Yep. Yep. Is that a fair assessment? No, that's a great assessment. Whether you want to refi out for a more long term uh, conventional loan or like Brandon does with private money, uh, it could be something that you can move fast in with cash and then refinance later. But if you didn't analyze it, re- you know, financed, you could be screwed at that point. So yeah, there you go. Cool. All right, so next one. Uh, is that you or me? I don't know. That's you. Syndication. Syndication, uh, this is basically pooling uh, other people's money together in order to to fund bigger deals. And so this could be a really good way to get into, you know, somebody like me, I can't go take down a 100-unit uh, apartment complex, um, not yet anyways. But if I have enough uh, friends and family and people who want to pool together in on the deal, it could be a great way to then uh, go after those bigger projects with bigger money. And so uh, that that's definitely a good way to graduate in the game for sure. Very cool. Excellent. Right, we got a couple more here. All right. We'll fly for these uh, self-directed IRAs. So IRAs are a great way to put your IRA money to work, whether it's in your own loan, uh, your own your own purchases. Um, there's a couple ways to do that. Um, it goes way longer than we have here, but uh, or you can actually become a private money lender and lend somebody else that money, um, then putting all the profits right back into your 401k and so or your IRA, excuse me, and uh, and put your money to work that way. You know, pay yourself an interest rate based on the note, and you're good to go. Awesome. All awesome. Right. So uh, last uh, last one here. What about just in general creative financing? Like, is there any other like clever creative things you can think of that we haven't covered? Yeah, there's a bunch. I mean, subject two is one of them. Uh, subject two, where you where you take uh, title to the property, subject to the loan staying in place. So, if I bought it from Brandon, uh, Brandon's Wells Fargo loan would stay in place. Uh, my name would then go on title, and um, I make his payments for him. He walks away um, from a problem property, and I just I don't have to go get that bank financing. I don't have to go uh, put cash on the line, and I don't have to get a private loan. The loan's already in place, and I'm just taking over his payments. Something like that. Very cool. short version, for sure. Very cool. All right, and there's a bunch more stuff. And, of course, if you want to learn more about funding deals, pick up Anson's book, biggerpockets.com slash great deals. We are very you know, proud to have released that. It's a very cool book. So, uh, But we're not quite done. We want to shift, shift gears here a little bit and head over to the world famous Fire Round. Fire Round. It's time for the Fire Round. All right, let's get to the fire round questions. These come direct from the Bigger Pockets forums, and we're going to fire them at Anson Young now. So watch out, Anson. Here you go. Number one, I am looking for a real estate agent to work with me on my first deal. What sort of things should they be able to help me with? And what separates a good real estate agent from someone who's not good? So a good real estate agent for, I'm assuming, investment properties here, since we're talking about that, um, would definitely have a track record themselves. Uh, I, I I get trying to want to work with newer agents and maybe they're hungrier and maybe they're this and that, but they don't have that grizzled steel of, you know, 
surviving the last downturn. And, you know, I, I kind of like that grit and, and agents and they've worked with investors and then they've made them money. Um, definitely triple check their numbers. Um, I don't trust anybody's numbers, whether it's a wholesaler or an agent or anybody, but uh, go find somebody who has the experience to then help you out. You know, they know their areas, they know their rents, they know what's coming in the neighborhood. Um, and that experience will will make up for your lack of experience being a newer investor for sure. And then I guess what makes a good and a bad one, I mean, uh, that experience is a big thing, but there could be too much experience where they're set in their ways yep. and they may think that, you know, uh, they may think contrary to all the new fangled stuff that comes up on bigger pockets that we all love. So I don't like that whole internet thing. Yeah. Internet. What is that? <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, yep. Uh, old school. Old school. All right. Next question. Bigger Pockets member Rachel asks, I have one rental property that I paid all cash for, $150,000. Right now, I'm looking to purchase more rental properties, think about four doors each in the 50K range, and would like to know how I could best make use of my equity from my one rental property. I've looked into getting a home equity loan. However, I was turned off by the high interest rate. I'm reaching out to all of you, Anson, <laughs> for suggestions. If you're in my situation, how would you go about doing the financing for my next four doors using the 150 K in my first rental property. So uh, that there's a hundred uh, different uh, things there, but definitely, I mean, apart from selling it and doing kind of a 1031 and playing monopoly into a bigger property, um, you know, uh, I guess, I, I guess the refi or the, the, what did she say? The, uh, there was the home HELOC, yeah. I guess, yep. wasn't working out for, um, you know, I maybe even just a you know seventy five percent refi yeah. and seeing if she can pull out you know that amount of money. So what that would be what one hundred and fifteen thousand something like that. Somewhere in there. Am I know. right? I don't know. Somewhere around seventy five percent of one hundred and fifty grand. She could pull that out um, at a better interest rate than definitely a HELOC. And so you can either play the monopoly, get do a ten thirty one exchange, uh, but that would require selling said property um, or. Uh, definitely find a, a better way than the high interest rate of the HELOC, which I think a, a refi could be that. Yeah, I love that. I think uh, she'd probably get like down to like 5% interest on a on a 30-year fixed and oh, yeah. be able to pull out over 100 grand. That should easily get her her four more properties, you know, with down Absolutely. payments anyway. Yeah, cool. Absolutely. All right, uh, nice question. And we'll we'll say this is the last of the fire rounds since the first question had a couple in there. Uh, <laughs> uh, how do you ask a seller? Did you just cut me off? Do you so, want to... Oh. So it's just, did you just cut me off? You asked the last one then, Josh. Here we go. No, you, you do it. It's fine. Go ahead. Go <laughs> all ahead. All right. Decapitate me. Look at, look at Josh all over do. their hurt wow. feelings. How wow, do you, yeah, I'm hurt. How, what are you doing? How do you ask a seller to carry the note? How do you ask a seller to carry the contract? So, so my favorite way to do this um, is to give them two or three different offers. So you, you basically give them a sheet that says, okay, option one is I buy... You know, I buy it for cash or I buy it for, you know, my private financing. That'll be, you know, $150,000 is, is the most I can pay in that scenario. And this is what it looks like. Option two is, you know, I can maybe pay up to one hundred and sixty-five dollars or $170,000, but that would require you, you know, for me to make monthly payments to you. And this is what it would look like. And you give the pros and cons of that too, because they might be looking for, you know, uh, maybe a tax break or a, they don't want to take the lump sum. Maybe they'd love to have monthly payments over the course of, of years. And so, you know, having those different options just kind of right up front, like, Hey, he here's what happens. If I just buy it, you walk away, we're all done. We shake hands, leave as friends. Here's one that looks like, Hey, I might, I can pay you more, but I'll pay you in installments over time. And it, depending on their situation, where they're at, what they're looking for, they may not they may not even have thought of option two, but here you are presenting it to them. And so they might want the cash lump sum today or they want may want payments over time. Either way, you're giving them the option there and showing them the difference of your offer for sure. I love that. I think that's fantastic right. advice. So cool. All right. All right. Good stuff. All right. Yeah, you can cut me off. It's fine. I, you know, right. I'm, I'm not, I don't matter. Um, <laughs> you don't. I know. Uh, uh, well, do you want to do well, the introduction to the my famous My mom would though? disagree. Your mom does love you. Do you want to do the introduction to the famous four? Oh, do I want to do the? Uh, I'm giving you yeah. the famous four. All right, Anton. I, I don't even know how you introduce the famous <laughs> four. They're like, all right, guys, this is the famous <laughs> four. Famous four. All right, we ask these questions on every single show. 
You know the questions already answered because we've asked them to you before. But let's hear what you have to say today. See if any of that changed. What's up to your dog? Brandon. <laughs> yeah. All right. What is your favorite real estate related book other than your own? Other than, oh, then I don't have one. <laughs> no, um, <laughs> I, I, I can't reuse read Rich Dad Poor Dad. I think I said that the first time. Um, I really do, and this is going to sound like me kissing up to Brandon, but I really oh, yes. do like his, his low and no money down book. Um, that has been on heavy rotation um, in my world here looking for you know creative ways to do stuff. That doesn't require full cash like Brandon can just throw out there and then get re- <laughs> refi it out there. So, by the way, yeah, I, when exactly. I do full cash, I'm buying them for like 15 grand. So, it's oh, a, it's a, this ain't Denver prices. That's, that's a different Brandon's world right family, there. If you're listening, <laughs> and, and that's a house with like four walls. I know. Roof? Yeah. Yeah. I got it, it at a government it's, auction. It was great. Wow. wow that's, that's that, is, that is crazy. All right. Next question Anson, favorite business book. My favorite business book in a in a kind of roundabout way is uh, is The Obstacle is the Way by Ryan Holiday, and it's more of like a mindset book, I would say. But um, but it's a great book that um, that deals with life, business, whatever you want it to. But I I I kind of like these kind of higher level uh, mindset books for business rather than like. Hey, here's the X Y Z of a business that you're not even related in. Yeah. Um, I do, I do like that that aspect, and that book is is incredible. So yeah, so, I like so that you one. got you got me a copy of that book, and it's sitting on my dresser next to my bed. I have not yet opened it. It's just sitting. I'm gonna get to it. I gotta get there. So you something might, I you something know I gave you, you sleep next to is what you're saying. <laughs> Oh, that, yeah. That's an honor. I, I like that. Yeah. You should because I, I hear Ryan Holiday listens to the Bigger Pockets podcast. So now you just offended uh, him. So great. Ryan, but, uh, apparently he's a fan. If you listen to the podcast, we would love to have you on. Yeah, Get in touch, you. man. Yeah, I agree. All right. So, uh, by the way, Ego is the Enemy is the other book. That was one of the most yes. life changing books I've ever read. I, I need to reread that one like every year. Says really the good. guy with the biggest ego I've ever read. <laughs> All right. right. So, Anson, next, right? Seriously. Anson, big guy, no big ego. ego. There yeah, you go. Baby. You're the same about yep. guys with big egos. Big heads. Hobbies. Hobbies, Anson. What are your hobbies? Really? What, are you I just got, what do you really? enjoy doing when you're not, you know, investing <laughs> in real estate and, you know, writing books? Well, let's see. No, we, we, we're we definitely outdoors here uh, in, in Denver, and we love to go up to the mountains and hike and uh, paddleboard and do obstacle races and all that fun stuff. Um, try to get out and uh, and live that active like lifestyle for sure. And then my other hobby is to go see uh, really loud rock and roll shows. So, yeah, uh, so I'm losing my hearing, you know, one show at a time for sure. So I love it. I love it. I just saw Metallica. It was unbelievable. Oh man, I saw that. That was you were like right there too. You yeah. Uh, I was. I, I caught the pick of destiny. But yeah, that was. <laughs> I was. That was amazing. Did you um, also? And- did you also go watch like I don't know like. Uh, Bare Naked Ladies or any other, other like 90s bands that are no longer relevant. <laughs> hey, Anson, so what sets apart successful investors from those who give up, fail, or never get started? Wow, stole it. Man, there he goes. Apples. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, think that there's a, I think that there's a lot of things. Um, the, the first one that comes to mind is, is, is having that laser focus in the beginning. I've said consistency in the past, and that is true, being consistent in the right things. You know, you can be consistent at the bad things and never get anywhere. But having that laser focus of where you want to go, uh, what the end goal is, you know, where are you investing? What are you, you know, what kind of deals are you going after? And I think on a higher level, like, who do you want to be? What do you want your company to look like? You know, what do you want it to represent in your community? And, and having laser focus in all those areas really sets your day-to-day tasks in order. I mean, you can just look at your big picture and you go, oh yeah, that's why I'm doing this. I may not like it right now, but I'm building towards something bigger. And having that focus helps you through cut through all those things. I love it. That's awesome. All right, man, before we let you go, where can people can find, people more, find about out about more about you? <laughs> oh man, where, where can, no, no, I missed it. Um, definitely. I think that the best way um, right now is through uh, my bigger pockets um, account and I get um, quite a few messages there from just the, the previous podcast, and that's worked out well. So I think it's uh, biggerpockets.com slash users slash Anson, and that, I think that that's me. Cool. Awesome. Awesome. And we'll link through that in the show notes, uh, which you can get to at biggerpockets.com slash show 235. Anson, thanks again. Congrats on the book. 
it's thank you. It's fantastic. We're really excited to be a part of it and uh, looking forward to helping lots and lots of people with it. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Thanks for uh, supporting the community and putting out this book as well. So that's uh, that's huge. So thanks to you both. Right on, man. All right, guys. That was Anson Young, author. He is now an author. He is author. An author. Of the book titled Finding and Funding Great Deals, The Hands-On Guide to Acquiring Real Estate in Any Market. A lot of good stuff, man. A lot lot. of good ideas, good strategies. Um, And of course, of course, we we highly recommend you get out there and pick up a copy of the book. Biggerpockets.com slash great deals. That's biggerpockets.com slash great deals. Or bigger biggerpockets.com slash store. Yep. You to, could probably to, also go to Amazon and like search for it if you wanted to. But. Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, you know, wherever you yeah. buy books, definitely uh, check it out. Yep. Um, this this thing is available in varying formats. Um, I oh, love by it. the way, you know, I don't, we didn't mention this in the show, but varying formats. So we do have a physical version. You can actually get, put this on your shelf. There's also oh, yeah, a digital sure. version. You can, you know, Kindle, iPad, phone, computer, uh, and also an audio version as well. So. You get there. You got your your choice of a smorgasbord. Smorgasbord. <laughs> did Did you ever watch the Muppet Show? Was I, that a little bit? Yeah. Do you remember the Swedish Chef? Yes. Skittier, bittier, <laughs> work, work, work. <laughs> you know, throw his forks and good. spoons around. That's, that's pretty good, right? That's pretty good. Yeah, you're good at Muppet impersonations. Yeah. Wow. Good job. Can I, I hear? Kermit? Can I hear Kermit? Um. Oh boy. What is Kermit <laughs> talking? Hold on. Let me try this. Oh. Uh, hello, no, no, I, no, that's a disaster. No, no. <laughs> that was the worst fish, impression. Fish of piggy. I don't know. I don't know what he sounds like. I have to listen first. <laughs> that was terrible. All right, let me put. All right, let's let's. Are we going to do impressions? Is that what we're no, going to do? No, we're not going to do impressions. <laughs> no, that was great. Anyway, Anson, big thanks to Anson for coming on the show. As we talked about in the beginning, if you want to dive in on any of these topics. Uh, go to go to biggerpockets.com, jump on our search engine, and you can find uh, anything and everything you're looking for. And until next time, because I am as red as a beet thanks to my ridiculously bad <laughs> the frog. Oh, I'm Josh fun. Stork. Signing off. You know. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online. It's time for it's time for it's time for the Random Five. All right, now we have one more segment of the show, which we like to throw in here at the end, called our Random Six. Random sex. Yeah, I don't know if we have a new sound effect there or not, but we'll try. All right. We're just going to ask you a few <laughs> random questions about yourself, Anson, to find out a little bit more about you. Nice. Number one, what is the most exciting thing you've ever done on a dare? Oh, boy. Um, you really put me on the spot here. I am. Um, on a dare, let's see. I've, I've eaten uh, – I've definitely eaten some, some things that you should not consume on a daily basis. Like uh, I, I saw Josh's uh, eating crickets and stuff. That was um, awesome. I think yeah, I ate a live cricket. The guy won't eat a pickle, but he eats crickets. I don't know. <laughs> Pickled crickets? It was his favorite. I, uh, you should see Josh in a restaurant. And, oh. and, and uh, what was it? Cricket and grasshopper. I ate them in one shot. Uh, Are they pretty good, though? Weird. They're like roasted, it was, though. Yeah. It was, uh, like, yeah, it wasn't bad. It was crunchy. It, was, it wasn't okay. terrible. Weird. Yeah, so I think the worst thing on a dare would be like the live cricket. Like, catch it in the yard. And when we were kids, you know, pop it in the mouth and it's very squishy, not dry. Not not so wow. good. Yeah. By the way, I know wow. this is not this is not my uh, random vibe, but I once got dared to eat two pounds of cheddar cheese. I got through a, about a pound and a half. Couldn't finish oh, it. Oh, I that explains that. a few things. Yeah, <laughs> that just yeah. sounds horrible in so many ways. <laughs> I didn't eat cheese right. for a long time. All right, next. On a one to ten scale, how do you rate your karaoke singing ability? And I think I know the answer. Um, I've never done karaoke. What? Although, yeah. What? Right. Well, really? now is a good time. I, yeah, we got to go do this. <laughs> but on the, on 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 the other side, I think one of my favorite spectator sports is is after you have a couple of drinks, is you sit there and watch other people do karaoke. Ah, uh, yes. It's it's literally the best. Like especially <laughs> if it's like late, like one a.m. and they've had too many drinks, and uh, yeah, it goes downhill real quick. <laughs> nice. <laughs> All right, what cartoon character do you identify most with? 
I really like um I think Calvin from Calvin and Hobbes is a good I guess it's not a cartoon, but it's a comic, yeah, I fair. guess. That's fair. Comic that's book fair. character. He's he's sarcastic, sassy, he knows more than a six year old should, and uh and has a, a huge imagination. So nice. I like that kid. Nice. So so next question and before I ask it, of course Brandon's a Scrooge McDuck. Um Oh, yeah. What do you do to relax? You don't know Scrooge McDuck is? Of course I do. Scrooge I go McDuck. swimming. I go swimming in my my coins. Exactly. That's what. Yeah. I yeah. Exactly. Your, your massive amount of money. <laughs> yeah. That's what I do. I swim in it. It's really good. Funding right. those <laughs> government auctions. Um, for me, <laughs> um, for me, I I I really do. Um, I I just started doing uh, jujitsu. And uh, oh. thanks, thanks to Nathan Brooks uh, for for a, yeah. for a big part of that, and um, and I find that you know like, pretty relaxing. Like you you get done with it, you know you worked hard, and um, and yeah, that the whole mental process of that is hugely re- relaxing for me. So very oh, cool. I like that's it. That's awesome. Yeah. All right, my next question. Uh, what? And I know the answer to this. What musical instrument? What musical instruments do you play? I play. Guitar and bass and a little bit of drums and a little bit of keyboard, but not not nearly enough of those other two to be proficient. But that's that's where I'm at. You and me need awesome. a jam sometime. We're gonna have fun. Maybe we'll bring Josh to sing. <laughs> oh yeah, I got what, this. What is Josh on a one to ten for his karaoke? Uh, easily, easily, easily a fifteen. A, Ooh, uh, exactly. Ego that's... is the enemy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I can blast out some Pearl Jam. Ooh. I can blast out some Metallica. No, no, no! I can't do that. I can't do that. All right, la- last question. Um, a lot of music questions here, Brandon. I didn't pick them. Uh, a, lot like of, a lot of music questions. Mindy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why don't we? Why don't we go with what's your favorite video game? Oh, my favorite video game. Let's see. Of all time, let's go with. Uh, I'm trying to think here. I really like. Like the old school Super Mario Brothers, yeah. Like, like, yeah. like, like three and uh, and the one, the first one that came out on Super Nintendo, I think it's just called Super Mario Brothers. Um, like those, we we just got a Raspberry Pi and you can do all the old games on it. And I sat there with my my six year old and we played like these old school games and we just had like it was it was taking me right back to old school, you know, Super Nintendo days and uh, and and yeah, the great games for sure. That's what very we're fun. Talking about. Awesome, awesome, man. Good uh, stuff. Well, thank you, Anson. We'll see you around. Thanks, Good guys. luck. Good luck on the book launch. Thank you. Yeah. Very much. <laughs>